Chapter 17 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Arabian Nights Entertainments by Andrew Lang. Chapter 17 The Second Voyage. I had resolved, as you know, on my return from my first voyage, to spend the rest of my days quietly in Baghdad, but very soon I grew tired of such an idle life, and longed once more to find myself upon the sea. I procured, therefore, such goods as were suitable for the places I intended to visit, and embarked for the second time in a good ship, with other merchants whom I knew to be honorable men. We went from island to island, often making excellent bargains, until one day we landed at a spot which, though covered with fruit trees and abounding with springs of excellent water, appeared to possess neither houses nor people. While my companions wandered here and there, gathering flowers and fruit, I sat down in a shady place, and having heartily enjoyed the provisions and the wine I had brought with me, I fell asleep, lulled by the murmur of the clear brook which flowed close by. How long I slept I know not, but when I opened my eyes and started to my feet, I perceived with horror that I was alone and that the ship was gone. I rushed to and fro like one distracted, uttering cries of despair, and when from the shore I saw the vessel under full sail just disappearing upon the horizon, I wished bitterly enough that I had been content to stay at home in safety." But since wishes could do me no good, I presently took courage and looked about me for a means of escape. When I had climbed a tall tree, I first of all directed my anxious glances toward the sea, but, finding nothing hopeful there, I turned landward, and my curiosity was excited by a huge, dazzling white object, so far off that I could not make out what it might be. Descending from the tree, I hastily collected what remained of my provisions, and set off as fast as I could go towards it. As I drew near, it seemed to me to be a white ball of immense size and height, and when I could touch it, I found it marvelously smooth and soft. As it was impossible to climb it, for it presented no foothold, I walked around it seeking some opening, but there was none. I counted, however, that it was at least fifty paces round. By this time the sun was near setting, but quite suddenly it fell dark. Something like a huge black cloud came swiftly over me, and I saw with amazement that it was a bird of extraordinary size which was hovering near. Then I remembered that I had often heard the sailors speak of a wonderful bird called a rock, and it occurred to me that the white object which had puzzled me must be its egg. Sure enough, the bird settled slowly down upon it, covering it with its wings to keep it warm, and I cowered close beside the egg in such a position that one of the bird's feet, which was as large as the trunk of a tree, was just in front of me. Taking off my turban, I bound myself securely to it with the linen, in the hope that the rock, when it took flight next morning, would bear me away with it from the desolate island. And this was precisely what did happen. As soon as the dawn appeared, the bird rose into the air, carrying me up and up, till I could no longer see the earth, and then suddenly it descended so swiftly that I almost lost consciousness. When I became aware that the rock had settled, and that I was once again upon solid ground, I hastily unbound my turban from its foot and freed myself, and that not a moment too soon, for the bird, pouncing upon a huge snake, killed it with a few blows from its powerful beak, and seizing it up, rose into the air once more, and soon disappeared from my view. When I had looked about me, I began to doubt if I had gained anything by quitting the desolate island. The valley in which I found myself was deep and narrow, and surrounded by mountains which towered into the clouds, and were so steep and rocky that there was no way of climbing up their sides. 
as I wandered about, seeking anxiously for some means of escaping from this trap, I observed that the ground was strewed with diamonds, some of them of an astonishing size. This sight gave me great pleasure, but my delight was speedily damped when I saw also numbers of horrible snakes, so long and so large, that the smallest of them could have swallowed an elephant with ease. Fortunately for me, they seemed to hide in caverns of the rocks by day, and only come out by night, probably because of their enemy, the rock. All day long I wandered up and down the valley, and when it grew dusk I crept into a little cave, and having blocked up the entrance to it with a stone, I ate part of my little store of food and lay down to sleep. But all through the night the serpents crawled to and fro, hissing horribly, so that I could scarcely close my eyes for terror. I was thankful when the morning light appeared, and when I judged by the silence that the serpents had retreated to their dens, I came tremblingly out of my cave, and wandered up and down the valley once more, kicking the diamonds contemptuously out of my path, for I felt that they were indeed vain things to a man in my situation. At last, overcome with weariness, I sat down upon a rock, but I had hardly closed my eyes when I was startled by something which fell to the ground with a thud close beside me. It was a huge piece of fresh meat, and as I stared at it several more pieces rolled over the cliffs in different places. I had always thought that the stories the sailors told of the famous Valley of Diamonds and of the cunning way with which some of the merchants had devised for getting at the precious stones were mere traveler's tales invented to give pleasures to the hearers, but now I perceived that they were surely true. These merchants came to the valley at the time when the eagles, which kept their aries in the rocks, had hatched their young. The merchants then threw great lumps of meat into the valley. These falling with so much force upon the diamonds were sure to take some of their precious stones with them when the eagles pounced upon the meat and carried it off to their nests to feed their hungry broods. Then the merchants, scaring away the parent birds with shouts and outcries, would secure their treasures. Until this moment I had looked upon the valley as my grave, for I had seen no possibility of getting out of it alive. But now I took courage and began to devise a means of escape. I began by picking up all the largest diamonds I could find and storing them carefully in the leathern wallet which had held my provisions. This I tied securely to my belt. I then chose the piece of meat which seemed most suited to my purpose and with the aid of my turban bound it firmly to my back. This done I laid down upon my face and awaited the coming of the eagles. I soon heard the flapping of their mighty wings above me, and had the satisfaction of feeling one of them seize upon my piece of meat, and me with it, and rise slowly toward his nest, in which he presently dropped me. Luckily for me the merchants were on the watch, and, setting up their usual outcries, they rushed to the nest, scaring away the eagle. Their amazement was great when they discovered me, and also their disappointment, and with one accord they fell to abusing me for having robbed them of their usual profit. Addressing myself to the one who seemed most aggrieved, I said, I am sure if you knew all that I have suffered, you would show more kindness toward me, and as for diamonds, I have enough here of the very best for you and me and all your company. So saying I showed them to him. The others all crowded around me, wondering at my adventures, and admiring the device by which I had escaped from the valley. And when they had led me to their camp and examined my diamonds, they assured me that in all the years that they had carried on their trade, they had seen no stones to be compared with them for size and beauty. I found that each merchant chose a particular nest, and took his chance of what he might find in it. So I begged the one who owned the nest to which I had been carried to take as much as he would of my treasure, 
but he contented himself with one stone, and that by no means the largest, assuring me that with such a gem his fortune was made, and he need toil no more. I stayed with the merchants several days, and then, as they were journeying homewards, I gladly accompanied them. Our way lay across high mountains infested with frightful serpents, but we had the good luck to escape them and came at last to the seashore. Thence we sailed to the Isle of Rohat, where the camphor trees grow to such a size that a hundred men could shelter under one of them with ease. The sap flows from an incision made high up in the tree into a vessel hung there to receive it, and soon hardens into the substance called camphor but the tree itself withers up and dies when it has been so treated. In this same island we saw the rhinoceros, an animal which is smaller than an elephant and larger than a buffalo. It has one horn about a cubit long which is solid, but has a furrow from the base to the tip. Upon it is traced in white lines the figure of a man. The rhinoceros fights with the elephant, and transfixing him with his horn, carries him off upon his head. But becoming blinded with the blood of his enemy, he falls helpless to the ground. And then comes the rock, and clutches them both in his talons, and takes them to feed his young. This doubtless astonishes you, but if you do not believe my tale, go to Rohat and see for yourself. For fear of wearying you, I pass over in silence, many other wonderful things which I saw in this island. Before we left, I exchanged one of my diamonds for much goodly merchandise, by which I profited greatly on our homeward way. At last we reached Balsora, whence I hastened to Baghdad, where my first action was to bestow large sums of money upon the poor, after which I settled down to enjoy tranquilly the riches I had gained with so much toil and pain. Having thus related the adventures of his second voyage, Sinbad again bestowed a hundred sequins upon Hinbad, inviting him to come again on the following day and hear how he fared upon his third voyage. The other guests also departed to their homes, but all returned at the same hour next day, including the porter, whose former life of hard work and poverty had already begun to seem to him like a bad dream. Again, after the feast was over, did Sinbad claim the attention of his guests and begin the account of his third voyage. End of chapter 17